Welcome back to the lab. In today's video, I'll be showcasing the synthesis of 2-bromopropanoic acid and ethyl 2-bromopropionate, starting from the amino acid alanine. Alpha-halo acids and their esters are remarkably useful reagents in organic synthesis. Typically to access these compounds, the hell volhard zielinski reaction is used. However, this requires some fairly inaccessible reagents, needing either elemental phosphorus or a phosphorus 3 halide and additionally, it requires the handling of elemental bromine, which can be unpleasant. In this video, I'm going to be demonstrating an alternative way to access these compounds, and specifically I'll be showing the conversion of L-alanine to alpha-bromopropanoic acid and its ethyl ester. The reason for me making this compound in particular is that I need it for my total synthesis series on the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory compound naproxen where this ester is going to be used to install the propionic acid side chain via an organozinc coupling reaction with 2-bromo-6-methoxynaphthalene, which I had been preparing over the past few videos starting all the way back from naphthalene. A quick search on YouTube led me to Nux's channel, where he demonstrated this reaction following a paper from tetrahedron asymmetry. In this paper, alanine was converted into its diazonium salt using sodium nitrate, and then substituted by bromide to form the bromopropanoic acid. The reaction seemed simple enough, but it had a few quirks, requiring the addition of solid sodium nitrite, and it was run on a fairly small scale. So I ended up making a few modifications to the procedure, and after a few attempts, I came up with this method that works fairly well and runs at a decent scale. To begin, I set up a 3-necked 500ml round bottom flask with a stir bar and thermocouple probe. To this, I add in 50 mL of water, 29.3 grams of sodium bromide, and 20 grams of L-alanine. Then I added in 75 mL of azeotropic hydrobromic acid, which I had prepared myself from sodium bromide and sulfuric acid. The addition of the hydrobromic acid caused a slight exotherm, with the temperature rising from 19 to 24 degrees Celsius. Now this reaction must be carried out at low temperatures, as is typical for diazotization reactions. So I stoppered the flask and moved it into the freezer to preemptively cool down. In the meantime, I prepared a solution of 46.7 grams of sodium nitrite dissolved in 67.5 mL of water, which was set aside and allowed to warm up to room temperature. This is an excess to what is actually needed for the reaction, but since I'm using a syringe pump for the addition, I'll need the excess to fill up the dead space in the tubing and syringe. I have previously attempted this reaction using various pressure equalized addition funnels, however, the high surface tension of the nitrite solution prevents the establishment of a constant slow drip rate and every few minutes the dripping would stop, requiring readjustment of the stopcock, although it still is entirely possible to use an addition funnel for this reaction. Next, I loaded the syringe with the previously prepared room temperature sodium nitrite solution. I then placed the syringe into the syringe pump and programmed it to inject 58.5 mL over a 1 hour period. Once everything was set up, I took the flask out of the freezer and placed it in a large bowl. To this bowl, I added 1 kg of calcium chloride hexahydrate which I had pre-chilled in the freezer, and 700 grams of ice. This mixture can easily reach negative 30 degrees Celsius, which is far colder than a typical ice salt bath. This is particularly ideal since the diazotization reaction is highly exothermic, and efficient cooling is required to mitigate the competing decomposition reactions. Soon after, the internal temperature of the flask reached nearly negative 20 degrees Celsius. I then set up the last part of the apparatus, feeding the outlet tube of the syringe pump in through a thermometer adapter on top of the flask. I then switched on the syringe pump, so beginning the 1 hour addition of the sodium nitrite solution. As soon as the first drop of nitrite hit the highly acidic solution inside the flask, there was the immediate production of orange nitrogen dioxide vapors. Looking at the tube dripping out the sodium nitrite solution, it seems that the drop rate is quite constant, but then a stream of about 4-5 to five drops falls out. This could be remedied by fitting a syringe onto the end of the tube. However, I did not do that during this experiment, but the results turned out fine regardless. At times, a stream of nitrogen dioxide gas can be seen escaping from the flask, and so using a fume hood for this reaction is essential. Also, the contents of the flask are nearly black due to the copious amounts of nitrogen dioxide dissolved in solution. About halfway through the addition, the internal temperature of the flask had risen to around negative 7 degrees Celsius, and over the course of the entire addition, the temperature never rose above negative 5 degrees Celsius. 
The contents of the cooling bath mixture were occasionally stirred around, and any large chunks were broken up, which led to a temporary decrease in the bath temperature. One thing I found curious about this reaction is that the product has the same stereochemical configuration as the starting L-alanine. This is not really expected as, after an SN2 of bromide at the diazonium, you'd expect to get inversion of the stereocenter. So what's going on? Well, there happens to be another intermediate in this reaction. Once the diazonium forms, it can be attacked intramolecularly by the adjacent carboxylate group. This is an SN2 reaction, which inverts the stereocenter and forms this three-membered ring. The three-membered ring is then opened in an SN2 fashion by bromide, which again inverts the stereocenter back to its original conformation, which overall makes this reaction stereoretentive. After the hour-long addition had elapsed, the syringe pump could be removed. Then the next step could begin, where the solution was simply stirred in the ice bath for another one hour. After the hour-long wait, the solution was still at around negative 5 degrees Celsius, and the next step is to swap out the ice bath for a room temperature water bath, where it was allowed to stand and warm up for 15 minutes. The solution was visibly colored yellow from the presence of nitrogen dioxide. In a previous run of this reaction, where I had only used an ice water bath, there was significantly more dissolved nitrogen dioxide, to the point where the solution was almost black. To remove the remaining nitrogen dioxide, I sparged the solution with argon for 30 minutes with a flow rate of 5 liters per minute. This successfully drove out all of the dissolved nitrogen dioxide, leaving me with a colorless solution. The reason for doing this sparging is because in the next step we'll be doing an extraction with dichloromethane, and DCM can react with nitrogen dioxide, forming colored impurities. These impurities will end up discoloring our final product, and will also carry over with the distilled DCM, hampering efforts to recycle the solvent. Returning back to the ongoing experiment, it can actually be seen that a thin layer of the product has phase separated out and is now sitting on top of the aqueous layer. To isolate the 2-bromopropanoic acid, I extracted the aqueous phase with three 100 milliliter portions of dichloromethane and alternatively, the DCM could be substituted for diethyl ether or even chloroform. The three DCM extracts were then pooled together and dried over anhydrous magnesium sulfate. This solution was then filtered into a 500 ml round bottom flask, and the residual magnesium sulfate was washed with two 20 ml portions of DCM to ensure a quantitative transfer. I then set up for a simple distillation and distilled off the bulk of the DCM using a hot water bath. Once the DCM stopped distilling over at atmospheric pressure, I emptied out the receiving flask and then put the whole apparatus under high vacuum to pull out any residual DCM. From this, I obtained 27.1 grams of a clear liquid with a slight yellow tint. This represents a crude yield of 79% from the starting alanine. Unfortunately, it's not quite the 95% yield that's reported in the paper, however, I did make quite a number of modifications to the original procedure, so some deviation could be expected. Though, all in all, I am quite satisfied with a 79% yield, seeing that all of the starting materials are readily available and quite inexpensive. To confirm the identity of the product, I measured its refractive index, finding it to be 1.4745 at 21 degrees Celsius. This closely aligns with the literature refractive index value of 1.475 at 20 degrees Celsius, thus showing that I have actually made 2-bromopropanoic acid. Additionally, this will also be the pure S enantiomer of 2-bromopropanoic acid, but I'll save the polarimetry experiments until after I synthesize its ethyl ester, which is the next step in my synthetic scheme for making naproxen. To begin the esterification reaction, the 500 ml flask, now containing 26.8 grams of the crude 2-bromopropanoic acid, was placed in a 500 ml heating mantle. To this was added 50 ml of chloroform, 27 ml of 95% ethanol, and 3 grams of paratoluene sulfonic acid monohydrate as our strong acid catalyst, which I had prepared myself 5 years earlier by the sulfonation of toluene. I then set up for reflux with a clavenger apparatus and charged the clavenger with 25 mL of chloroform. I then ran water through the condenser and started heating. After some time, vapors can be seen rising up through the arm of the clavenger apparatus. The purpose of this setup is to separate out the water that is formed during the esterification. 
By physically removing the water from the reaction flask, it prevents the reverse reaction of the ester being hydrolyzed back into the starting materials, resulting in an overall improvement to the yield. The use of chloroform as the solvent is critical to this process. Chloroform and water form a low-boiling azeotrope, and so water and chloroform will co-distill with each other, and once these vapors reach the condenser, they'll return back to being a liquid and undergo phase separation, since water and chloroform are immiscible with each other, and as chloroform is denser, it will sink to the bottom, and the water will remain on top. The Clevenger apparatus was drained every hour, with the chloroform layer being returned into the setup. The reflux was conducted for a total of four hours, after which the water collection essentially halted, indicating completion of the reaction. The heating was stopped and the apparatus was allowed to cool down, before draining off the chloroform that remained in the trap of the clevenger. Then the rest of the apparatus was disassembled and replaced with a fractional distillation setup. On heating, the chloroform and ethanol begin to boil off first and are collected in the receiving flask. To push over the last of the ethanol, I insulated the fractional column using aluminum foil. Shortly after, the rate of distillation slowed down and the stillhead temperature began dropping. During this time, the ethyl 2 bromopropionate, which boils at around 160 to 166 degrees Celsius, began climbing up the column. Soon enough, the stillhead temperature began rapidly climbing and distillate was starting to be collected. At this point, you would typically switch out the receiving flask and collect your product. However, what I did instead was remove all the aluminum foil and drop the mantle to quickly stop the distillation. My reason for doing this was so that I could replace the condenser and receiving adapter with clean glassware. This was to ensure the elimination of any chloroform or ethanol from the product fraction, since we're going to be using this material in an organometallic coupling, and any product impurities will result in the organometallic reagent being destroyed. Now with a clean setup assembled, the heating was turned back on, resuming the distillation. At this point, the only things remaining in the distilling flask is the ethyl 2 bromopropionate, paratoluene sulfonic acid, which is not particularly volatile, and any unknown impurities. Knowing this, I just cranked up the heating on the mantle, allowing me to rapidly distill over the product. The first few drops of distillate came over at around 160 degrees Celsius, However, the bulk of the product distilled over between 164 and 166 degrees Celsius. The Merck Index lists two boiling points for ethyl 2 bromopropionate, being 159 to 160 degrees and 160 to 165 degrees, which is fairly well aligned with what I observed. Eventually, the rate of distillation slowed and the stillhead temperature began dropping. This observation shows that I've collected as much ethyl 2 bromopropionate as I could. So I turned off the heat and stopped the distillation. In total, I collected 24.2 grams of a clear colorless liquid. This represents a 76% yield from our starting crude 2-bromopropanoic acid, or a 60% yield in total from the starting alanine. As I followed a known literature procedure and obtained a product that had the correct boiling point range, I would be confident in saying that I have successfully made ethyl 2S bromopropionate. Though in chemistry, characterizing your product is half the battle, and is a key part to the overall synthetic story. The first test I did was to measure the refractive index. A few drops of the sample were loaded into the refractometer. Looking through its scope, I adjusted the dials to center the dividing line of the light and dark hemispheres in between the crosshair. I then adjusted the dispersion control to remove the chromatic aberration, producing a crisp black and white line. I then read the refractive index, finding it to be 1.4455 at 20 degrees Celsius. This closely aligns with the reported refractive index values of 1.446 and 1.4469 listed by Sigma and in the Merck index. I also took a rough measurement of the specific gravity using a 10 mil volumetric flask finding it to be 1.402 to 1.404 grams per milliliter at 20 degrees Celsius, closely aligned with the 1.394 grams per mil reported by Sigma. Since I started with naturally derived L-alanine, the product should also be the Enantio Pure S enantiomer. And the easiest way to check that is by measuring the optical rotation of the sample using a polarimeter. 
To acquire this measurement, I first prepared a solution of the sample in chloroform with a concentration of about 4.24 grams per 100 mL. This solution was then transferred into the polarimeter cell and loaded into the polarimeter. Looking through the scope, a central bar can be seen that's flanked by two hemispheres. When the dial on the polarimeter is adjusted, the colors of the central bar and hemispheres are seen to invert. With further fine adjustment, the boundaries between the hemispheres and central bar can be made to disappear. At this point, the rotatable polarizer is now aligned with the direction of polarization of the light that has exited from the solution. And as such, the relative angle between the first polarizer and the second rotatable polarizer is the measured optical rotation of the sample. And in this case, it came out to be negative 2.6 to negative 2.8 degrees, which results in a calculated observed rotation of negative 30.7 to negative 33 degrees. This range fits very well to the reported literature-specific rotations of negative 30.3 to negative 32.4 degrees, thus showing that I do in fact have an enantiopure sample of ethyl 2S bromopropionate. And finally, the last and most telling characterization method that I employed was nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Looking at the proton NMR in deuterated chloroform, the observed chemical shifts, splitting patterns, and integrations of the main peaks all correspond with that of the literature values for ethyl 2 bromopropionate. Most of the smaller peaks around the baseline can be attributed to carbon 13 satellite signals. Although it can be seen that there is also a very small amount of ethanol, as given by the presence of a quartet at 3.7 ppm. And based on the integration value of this peak, it shows that there is 0.3% ethanol contamination by weight. Given that there are some other unidentified peaks on the baseline, I would say that the overall purity of the sample is greater than 99%. I also ran a carbon-13 NMR, with the chemical shifts of each peak again aligning with the expected literature values. Now with all of this data in hand, I am entirely confident in saying that I have successfully prepared a high purity sample of ethyl 2S bromopropionate, starting from L-alanine. In other news, I'm glad to see that the channel is still slowly growing despite my infrequent posting, so I'd like to thank everyone who subscribed in between these content droughts. I'd also like to thank you, the viewer, for watching through to the end of this video, and a special thanks to my Patreons for helping support the channel. For future uploads, I'm planning to post a few smaller videos on some side projects that I've been working on before finishing off the big naproxen synthesis series. Thanks for watching.